folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2014, our top secret broadcasting compound with another Watchman video broadcast. This is the first part of a series in which we're going to examine something that um, a lot of people, if you students of prophecy, you know 2 Thessalonians 2, it talks about the man of sin, the temple of God, he that now letteth will let, and all of those things. But we're going to examine this concept of what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2 of this falling away first. I think as people who take the Bible seriously and who seek to study it and believe exactly what it says, believe everything that it says, I think that this is a concept that we should cover, that we should go over not just here at the Watchman Broadcast, but God's people should study this idea. Just think of things in the Bible that fall. Now, as you study the Scriptures, King James Scriptures, you, you look for things that fell. You're going to see a lot of places in the Bible where people uh, fell down and they worship Christ or they worship God in some way. We're not talking about that kind of falling. That kind of falling is a, is a voluntary submission and humility to the total awesomeness that is God in Jesus Christ. We're talking about a different sort of falling, a falling not toward, but a falling away. And what we're going to do, we're going to start in 2 Thessalonians 2. If you want to get your Bibles ready, that's where I'm going. But we're going to look at things in the Bible that fall. If I were to ask you, can you just right off the top of your head, Give me something in the Bible that you see falling in the Bible. Some of you already are going, I saw Satan fall as lightning. There you go. That's what we're looking at. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Babylon is fallen, is fallen. What happened to the walls of Jericho? They fell. What did all the people do in the plain of Dura? They fell. They fell away, except three. Who did what? They stood. That's, the, that's how simple the Bible is. Standing is the opposite of falling. And we'll see from the scriptures that when the Holy Ghost empowers a saint, someone who is truly born again and has the seal, the earnest of God's promise in them, God empowers them to stand when everything else falls around them. So these are the things that we're going to look at is in this video series. We're going to look at things that fall so that we can get an understanding of precisely what 2 Thessalonians 2 is dealing with. So we're going to st stick just with the scriptures in understanding what falls. Now I've got a few pictures to show you, a couple other things we're going to throw in here, but pretty much we're going to stick with what the King James Bible says. So let's go, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says, Now we beseech you, brethren. Notice who he's addressing this to. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's something that you and I are looking for, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man, listen to it now, let no man, that means Billy Graham, the Pope, Mike Hogger, Jack Van Impey, Clarence Larkin, Charles Darwin, don't let anybody deceive you. You read and study what this book says and you stick with what this book says. If, I, if I'm going to be wrong in anything that I say here and you judge that I am wrong in something that I said here, then go back to the Word of God and let God show you what the truth is. Is that fair enough? Because I don't think everybody has to follow me and live off everything that I say. In fact, I think that's a really bad idea. All I want to do is get you into this book the way we're supposed to be, and we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved to the denomination. No, that's not what it says. Study to show yourself approved unto God. He's your judge. I'm not, don't let anybody else be either. So, watch out now. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And there it is right there. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, 
who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now I'm going to go back to these verses. We're going to look at them line upon line, precept upon precept, and we're going to see exactly what he's getting at. Number one, he said, we beseech you brethren. He's talking to those who are brethren in Christ. We are, we are the sons of God. That's what makes us brethren. We have the same father. I have been accused of going against people and doing it in an unscriptural way because these people are our brethren and you're supposed to go to them privately. And some of the people that I've gone after, I tell people, no, mm -mm, we're not, we don't have the same father. My DNA, my DNA has been tested and we don't have, we don't have the same DNA. But he's talking about brethren. He's talking about us. By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So this is the context that I didn't put it in, of Ryrie didn't put it in there or take it away from, Van Impey doesn't put it in or take it away from. This is the context that Paul put it in. He said, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. You and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, who have the hope of eternal life, Christ will come and will gather together his elect. He will gather together his people from all over the world. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. See the word there? Paul said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trump shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So this is the gathering that he's referring to. He said that you be not soon shaken in mind. Study things that are, study the idea that when Christ comes again, he's going to shake both heaven and earth. And I want you to hang on to that. Because what happens if you went to a fig tree, my grandfather, Peepaw, don't make fun of that. My Peepaw had a fig tree at his place, right next to his garden. And I loved that fig tree. When that fig tree, when that thing was full of ripened figs, it was a joy for me to go out there, all right? What would happen if you went to a fig tree and you shook it? What would happen to all the figs? the untimely figs would what? Would fall. Study the shaking that is coming to this world. Study that. Okay, Jesus talked about earthquakes in diverse places, yet he's going to shake heavens and earth once again. So that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit. Don't let a spirit trouble you. Don't let it make you afraid. I, I have an issue with that. I, there are devils that can make me afraid, and they know it. Okay? I can't just say, be gone, devils, I'm not afraid of you. I can't do that. What I can do is I can go to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and say, Jesus, make them go away. Make them stop. He always does. I love it. Anyway, uh, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us. Don't be shaken in mind. Don't be troubled by commentaries from the prophecy experts. Just read the sure word of prophecy, all right? Nor by letter as from us is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. New Bibles, prophecy books, prophecy conferences, lectures, the book of Enoch, let no man deceive you by any means. You know what I think it's best for God's people to do? I think it's best for God's people, rather than reading books about prophecy and prophetic ideologies, I think it's better for God's people to just read the sure word of prophecy. That's how God began this ministry. Because when God called me into this, 19, 1997, I thought, yeah, I'll study prophecy. Shoot, I'm going to go down to the bookstore and buy some Grant Jeffries books, and I'm going to buy some, 
I'm going to buy some uh, Jack Van Impe stuff, and I'm going to get some Tex Mars stuff, and I'm going to find out what all these guys are saying, and I'm going to teach that. God should know, Mike. I wrote a book of prophecy. I want you to read it. I want you to study it. Lord, where do you want me to begin? Just open it up. Open it up. Start reading. I'll help you. That's what the Holy Ghost does, people. He brings things to light. He brings things to our mind and our heart that are inside of this Bible. And we can be easily deceived by other means. So, just put them all away. Get out your King James Bible. Just start reading. Well, I don't understand everything it says. Keep reading. Keep reading. You'll get precept and then precept. You'll get line upon line, and you'll get here a little and there a little. That's Isaiah 28, in case you don't know. Go study that. That's what you'll get. That's what God will give you. He'll deliver those things to you if you ask Him. Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. You know what somebody did? Somebody, somebody commented when I talked about that verse, Jeremiah 33, 3. They made fun of me and said, Hoggard, you're an idiot. That verse is not for you. That was for Jeremiah. I'm going, why am I reading it in my Bible then? This book is my book. I'm supposed to read it, study it, know it, memorize it, let God apply it in my life, let it breathe in me. That's what I'm supposed to do. Anyway, don't let anybody deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Now, I just thought of this when I was reading this a while ago. I don't know if I still have the book here. I might. Somebody sent me a Jimmy Swaggart King James Bible. It is loaded with Jimmy and Donnie Swaggart's correction of the Word of God. And I mean loaded. You open it up. You, if you have a copy, you go to different places all throughout the Bible. And you'll see where they'll say, now the original Hebrew, it should have been translated this way. Original Greek, it, it was a better translation of this is. And let me tell you what they did here. Let me tell you what they did. This is a perfect example of the deception that comes out of the scholars, the experts' mouths, who instead of wanting you to believe the Bible, they want you to believe them first. Because Swaggart, Jimmy, and Donnie do not believe the Bible. They say they do. But they don't because they are constantly correcting it. And see, they have this preconceived idea that nothing happens prior to our gathering together unto Christ. That is in direct contradiction to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So to at least... Two things are going to happen prior to us being gathered together unto Christ. Number one, a falling away. Number two, the man of sin being revealed. Here's what they did. They decided that they didn't like how that was translated because it didn't match their doctrine. So you know what they did? They retranslated it. And they said... Now, this, this, this really should have been translated. A better translation of this come a falling away first is a catching up. See what they did? Let me read it that way. Let me deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except we are caught up first. And then that man is saying, see what that does? They decided that their doctrine was an authority over the Word of God instead of the other way around. You would be surprised. You would be surprised at the number of quote-unquote independent fundamental King James only teachers and preachers who secretly believe that. You'd be surprised. Ask some of them, okay? But it's, that's what it says. Without altering the Word of God, which I do not have a right to, Without altering the Word of God, it specifically says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except 
there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so the Bible, you leave it alone, let it say exactly what it says, and you plainly see that the Bible's telling you that before the gathering of God's people, a falling takes place. And I believe that you and I, if we are of that generation who meets the Lord in the air to be with Him and those dead in Christ rising first, my dad, can't wait, can't wait to see Him. He's going to rise before me. And I'm going to see him in the air, and we're going to gather together with Jesus. Before that happens, you and I are going to see a falling away take place. So I think it's important if you just believe the Bible, and don't try to change it, don't try to alter it, don't try to make it say what it's not saying here. It's very plain. Just leave it alone. I think this is why it's important for us to find out what's going to fall. So I mentioned before that falling is the opposite of standing. So I'm going to show you a few. I'm going to show you where I'm coming from on this, and um, you can study in the scriptures yourself things that stand versus things that fall. All right, First Corinthians 16:13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Galatians 5:1. Stand fast, there it is again, therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. If, you were to, if we were to just go back and look at these now in the, in the light and the context of those who are going to fall away, let's look at it. He says, 1 Corinthians 16, that we are to stand fast in what? The faith. That is the terms of the New Testament. That's the terms of our salvation. Our salvation is hinged upon God's grace being applied because of our faith. For by grace are you saved, how? Through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And don't let anybody tell you that garbage nonsense that belief and faith is a work. That's ridiculous. The New Testament stands as an as a, uh, offer of salvation in direct contradiction to the terms of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant said, you must do, you must perform all of these works. You must, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt uh, honor thy father and thy mother, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. That's what God said do. And he said, you have to do every one of them. If you break just one, you voided the contract. But we have a new contract. We have a new covenant. Now, it doesn't say um, you don't have to do anything. You don't even have to believe. I'm just going to pick and choose some people, and they're going to be saved no matter what. That's Calvinism, or that's something close to Calvinism, or some people believe that, which is a bunch of hooey. It tells us that we are to believe. We are to do what? We are to stand fast in the faith Quit you like men, be strong. Paul says um, almost identical thing. First, or excuse me, Galatians chapter five. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And if you study Galatians, you'll understand that Paul was preaching a gospel that was totally contradictory to law keeping or a works based salvation. Totally contradictory to it. Paul said, "So what if you're circumcised? If you sin one time, it's all, it's like you never circumcised again." So what if you keep the Sabbath? If you were looking down some gal's blouse at the store, what difference does it make if you keep the Sabbath? That's, that's the, the lunacy of those who are trying to teach people that you have to keep as much of the Old Testament law as you can in order to please God, because that's what God called us to. It's a bunch of nonsense. God calls us to faith. Noah believed God. Abraham believed God. Moses believed God. David believed God. Where are these people right now? They're in heaven. Why? They believed God. And so the terms of the new covenant is stand fast 
Therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, be not what? Entangled, again, in the yoke of bondage. Think about things that tangle. Think about wild vines that are tangled. Think about, I don't know, we, when I was a boy, we used to run through the woods. I mean, we owned every square inch of the woods back behind our houses. Wasn't a piece of it we didn't know. Every now and then, we get tangled in what we called sticker bushes. They were just thorns, is what they were, thorn bushes, thorn trees all over the place. And once you got in there, man, it was hard to get out. I mean, you got in them fast. You never got out of them fast, okay? And that's, what, that's the idea he's given us. Be not entangled again. Again. Because at one time, everybody in church was entangled in the law of sin and death. We were entangled in the yoke of bondage and the yoke of death. Christ calls us out of that. And Paul says, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you with this doctrine? And I'm telling you to stand fast in the faith that you're not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Paul said, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Because watch this, here's, here's two of you. And this is how it always happens. If you're yoked with somebody, when they fall, what's going to happen? You're going to fall with them. Why? You're yoked with them. What's the remedy for that? Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden's light. Is Jesus ever going to fall? No. So when you're yoked with Christ, <laughs> when He rises, you're rising. See how, see how simple we just make, we just believe exactly what the Bible says. Luke chapter 8, verse 13. In fact, let me turn there. Let's get a little context of what Luke chapter 8 is all about. Let's just, um, let's just believe the Bible, shall we? Okay. And Luke 8, 8, verse 13, I'll read the verse and we'll kind of, the Bible says walk circumspectly, which means look around in a circle. That's what it means. So we're not just going to read this verse and isolate it from the context that it's in. We're going to go read what, this, what is encircling this verse so we can have an understanding. Luke 8, 13, They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root which for a while believe, and in time of temptation, what do they do? Fall away. It, 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 almost, almost the exact same words that Paul used in 2 Thessalonians 2. There should be a falling away first. And so now we're starting to get an idea of why this falling away takes place. What happened here? In Luke chapter 8, Jesus is teaching the parable of the seed and the, and the sower. You can find this in Mark chapter 4. You can find it in the book of Matthew as well. If you want to compare all three of those, you'll get, you'll get the ideas and the concepts that Jesus is trying to teach there. Jesus was teaching, the, he was telling the parable to everybody. And those Jews were just sitting there going, yeah, nice story, bro. What's he talking about? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. And, you know, he's been hanging around with the publicans and no telling what he's on. But he gets around his disciples and he says, Under you is given an oath to mysteries of the kingdom. I'm going to teach you what this. He said, the, the seed, verse 11, the seed is the word of God, it's the Bible. This is what we're to have faith in, this is what we're to stand. On. This is what we are to be born with, the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. And he said, verse 12, these, those by the wayside are they that hear when they then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Okay? And I, I've known people like this, you know people like this, you try to give them scripture, and you give them scripture, you give them the Word of God. And what do they do? They belch, crush their beer can, open up another one. Are you about done, preacher? Do you like a bear? I had a, I knew a guy that, I knew a preacher had that happen to him. What happened? That man, that man had so many strongholds of devils in his life. Alcohol was one of them. Probably, probably adultery is another one. Probably hatred, anger. 
probably all these things. He had so many strongholds of the devil in him that as soon as that seed goes out there in his life, devils go, mm, and they gobble it up. And, that, and just think about it. You throw a seed out in the field, and if the bird sees it, what are they going to do? They're going to eat it. And that seed is never going to have a chance to take root and produce fruit. Never. Then he gets to the second group. These are they on the, on the rock. And he's referring to, if you look at the other ones and compare them, it's stony ground. Hard heartedness. Think of um, Nabal in 1 Samuel chapter 25. His heart turned stone. Ten days, that's the law. And he died. And Abigail, who was married to him, was under his authority and dominion as long as he lived. But once he died, she's now free to go marry another. And that was David. Isn't it beautiful? Just compare Romans 7, 1 Samuel chapter 25. But here we have, here, and, and watch this now. That first group, those beer guzzlers, you give them tracts, you give them Bible verses, they don't care. They have no concern with you and your gospel whatsoever. Street preachers out on the street preaching the word of God. I say, brethren, go get them. Go get them. You preach that old King James Bible, you throw them Bible verses out there because either God's going to save some people with it or God is going to damn those people because they heard the word of God and didn't respond. So you guys, you keep it up. But here's, so that's the first group. These guys are not coming to church, except for the wedding and their own funeral, probably. So uh, my mother-in-law, bless her heart, she always had this idea, yeah, people, nobody wants anything to do with the preacher until their funeral. I think you ought to tell them, if you would, when you die, don't call the preacher, call the bartender, because that's who you spent your time with. And I'm going, not bad. Anyway, look at this. So the wayside people, they don't come to church. Not going to either. Verse 13. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. They started. He's saying, Pastor, what are you saying? I don't think everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom. I don't think everybody who runs down to an altar in a time of, of great need is truly born again. I think we have people sitting in churches as members, deacons, board members, committee members, Sunday school teachers, big donors, preachers and pastors who have a stone over their heart and the truth of the Word of God has no way of taking root. That's what I think. I think we have churches full of people who say, Lord, Lord, and they're not going to be in the kingdom. They're not going to be in heaven. They're not. They're going to hell. Because look what it says. These have no root. Why? They have a, they have a hard heart. They, they initially said they believed John 3.16. Okay? But then some guy starts preaching against evolution, preaching literal Genesis chapter 1, literal six days. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe that's a bunch of nonsense. It's a bunch of hooey. That story about that ark, yeah, I saw that on the History Channel. That was, that was some local deal that everybody heard about. That wasn't no universal flood. That is a stony, that is a stone heart where the Word of God does not take root. Now, I want to tell you something. You say you're going to believe God for salvation. With God, it's all or nothing. You either believe what God said and the testimony that God put in this book, or you call Him a liar. But here's what happens. Because you have no root, which for a while, believe in, in time of temptation, fall away. I've told this story before. I have a septic tank sitting in my backyard that in the springtime, grass grows amazingly on it. It's nice and green and pretty, and you can't even hardly tell where it is. About late July and August, because the rain dries up around here at that time, and it's hot, 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 all of a sudden now, there's a great big rectangle, brown rectangle, in my backyard. What is that? That's the grass that could not bring forth root. Therefore, they did not bring forth fruit. That grass is withered and fades away. And look what it says, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation, what happens? They fall away. 
Because I'm going to tell you, this Bible teaches us that those who are sealed, those who are truly born again, do not stop believing. Oh, I can tell you, I've had a few times where I kind of struggled with, did I really believe what God said or not? God always helped me through those times. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people that just say, you know what, I don't believe that nonsense anymore. And they get, that something happens, and they get burned, and they have no root, and they fall away. They don't go to heaven. That which fell among thorns are they which when they hurt, have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Fruit bearing is always the mark of a genuine born again, saved, have the earnest of the Spirit inside of them, born again, Son of God. Fruit bearing always is. What did Jesus say? You shall know them by their what? Fruits. You cannot, I, listen, I'm glad it's not up to me to decide who's saved and who's not by pointing at people's lives. But I'm telling you, if that person bears and brings forth no fruit of the Spirit of God, they're not saved. It's as simple as that. But that on good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it. They believed it to the end. They kept it. And bring forth fruit with patience. Mm, go, go, Go study all these things in the Bible. So this is, this is what's going on. We've got people sitting in churches right now who have decided they don't believe the whole Bible. They think the Bible's got errors and mistakes in it. They think some of them stories are a bunch of hooey. They think some of those ways of living, don't, don't mean, don't, uh, they don't matter for them. They've taken whole portions of the scripture and said, well, that's not for us anymore. That's, that's for somebody else women preachers behind pulpits, women as bishops, and so on. They've decided that portions of the scripture don't really apply to them. They belong to somebody else. They have stony ground. And then we have churches, we have denominations, we have pastors, we have church leaders, we have people in churches whose lives are so full of sin that it just chokes the Word of God every time it's preached and it chokes it out, produces no fruit. You can go argue with the Bible if you want to because that's exactly what it says and I believe what it says. So this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with people. We're dealing with denominations that are falling away. We're dealing with ministries that are falling away. We're dealing with guys who at one time stood on the Word of God who now are compromising and falling away. This is what we're dealing with right now. We might as well just wake up and smell it for what it is and not pacify it anymore. This is exactly what's going on. This is where I was headed. God intervened in my life with a, with a rod. But that's what, it's, that's what it's referring to. Let me read some more. Proverbs chapter 20, 25, verse 26, A righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. Stop right here. A righteous man falling down before the wicked. See it? <whistles> falling down. You know what he is now? He's a corrupt spring. That is the opposite of the pure living waters of Jesus Christ and his pure, undefiled, incorruptible word. So what the Bible's doing, it's connecting the two. Here you, have a, here you have a church man or a church woman or a church or a denomination or a ministry of some kind. They fall down before the wicked. Oh, bless God, we've got, uh, we've got uh, Rabbi so-and-so. He's going to come in here and show us the Hebrew roots of our faith. Oh, praise the Lord, we have Father, uh, Jesuit Father Smith coming to us right from the Vatican who's going to teach us how to pray. See how it works? And all of a sudden now, those churches that used to be right and used to preach the righteousness of Christ have fallen away and they've fallen before a wicked man. And they're a troubled fountain in a corrupt spring. Nothing comes, you cannot get clean water out of a corrupt spring. Can't do it. 
Some of you know some. Some of you have uh, sp springs with sulfur in it. I've been to some of those places. Whew, boy, you guys stink. But anyway, that's what that is. You cannot ever get clean water out of a sulfur spring. Won't work. Proverbs 11.5, the righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. Stop right here. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way. The righteousness is of Christ. And we are perfect because of the righteousness of Christ. And it's that spirit of righteousness and the righteousness of Christ in his word that direct us in our goings and keep us from falling. We are kept by God's power. But then, how do the wicked fall? Because of their own sin, their own wickedness. Let me tell you what I think is going to happen. I think there's going to come a time. You know, you look around, I, I, I've been, you know, many places in this country. I've been uh, to Kenya, I, and I can tell you there's a lot of churches over in Kenya. Are they all right? Mm, I would have to say no. Do, and I, do I know which ones are and which ones aren't? No. But you know what I think? I think there's going to come a time when God's going to draw a line and all of His true saints, those whom He has sealed and He has kept standing, living by faith of the Word of God, will be here and all of those falling will be over here. Then it'll be known whose side who is on. Proverbs eleven fourteen, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. No, the counsel is the word of God. Jesus is the counselor. And if Jesus and his word is not present, the people are going to fall. You can say whatever you want to about their doctrine. You can say whatever you want to about their mission work. You can say whatever you want to about how much money they bring in. On and on and on and on. But if they have abandoned the counselor, they will fall. Because the counselor, when he's listened to, will tell them, don't go over there, you'll fall. Don't do, don't do that. But he said in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. That's why there's more than one book in the Bible. Okay? That's why you should read more than one book, more than one person in the, in the Bible, not just Paul. Read Peter, read James, read Matthew, read Isaiah, read David, read Moses. Uh, Proverbs eleven twenty eight. He that trusteth in his riches shall fall. There's another one. But the righteous shall flourish as a branch. See there? The branch flourishes. You know what the word flourish means? It has the word flower in it. Flowering is always a picture of what happens before the fruit comes out. Boy, just think about this Bible. He that trusteth in his riches shall fall. Benny Hinn. Creflo the mighty dollar. All right. Proverbs 13, 17. A wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is health. These are just these are ideas and concepts that God is teaching us when he talks about this falling away in 2 Thessalonians 2. The Bible then is teaching you what to look for. The Bible's teaching you, number one, what to look for in your life. Don't you dare take anything that I bring out here as far as Scripture is concerned and start going, yeah, that's that group over there. Yeah, that's them fellers over there. Yeah, I know how they are. Bless God, I'm not that way. Take heed. Take heed. Take these things and look here first. And say, God, am I following riches? Who am I letting counsel me? What books am I reading? What, um, what prophecy manuals am I going by? How am I, how am I raising my family? Am I listening to what's on TV or do I do it according to the Word of God? Show me what to believe, God, and I'll believe it. But you start looking at yourself. Are you trusting in your own righteousness? Are you trusting in your riches? Are you, are you full of wickedness? God has to chastise you as a son and bring you out of that stuff. Those are things that you start looking here so that you're not part of this. And I, I, and I promise you, those who will do that, those are the ones that are sealed by the Holy Ghost. Okay. Proverbs 16, 18, you know this one. Pride goeth before destruction 
and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 26, 27, Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. Proverbs 28, 10, Whoso causeth the righteous to go astray in an evil way, he shall fall himself into his own pit, but the upright shall have good things in possession. Think of what, look at the language here. We have those that fall and those who are what? Upright. This versus this. See the contrast there? This person here, because they are upright, they're going to stand. God's going to keep them. God's going to hold them up. They're going to stand. But there are people. They're digging pits right now. Digging their own graves, we call it. Okay? They're full of pride. They have a haughty spirit. Those are the ones that are going to fall. Those who are digging a pit are going to, um, are going to fall inside that pit. I'm, I'm just kind of got a little thought here. Got a little thought here. I think to look for some teaching um, moving into the church that involves digging down in something, digging down deep or, you know, like being in a cave or something like that. I, I'm just, just kind of thinking, I think this verse actually means what it says and I think there's probably, may already be, but I think there's probably some teaching on the horizon that's going to try to teach church people to dig down deep in a pit so they can find God down in there. You watch and say, I may be wrong, but you watch and see. And isn't it interesting that there is a rock and roll group, one of the most evil, lascivious, nasty, dope-headed, drunkards, fornicators in the entire world, the Rolling Stones. He that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. That's what I think that means. Anyway, let's move on. Proverbs 28, 18. Whoso walketh uprightly shall be saved. But he that is perverse in his ways shall fall at once. Looky here. Proverbs 28, 18, to me, matches perfectly with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses, uh, verses 2 and, and uh, yeah, verses 2 and 3. I think that matches it perfectly. I think those who walk uprightly, those who are standing, those who do not fall away, I think they're going to be saved. That's what it says. But I think that there is people in church, in pulpits, in denominations, who have a perverse nature. You know what that means? Watch this. Watch this. Okay? This is, let me do this. Okay? This is the book, and uh, I'm going to read Acts chapter 8, verse 37, out of the book. Ready? There, I just read it. It's not in here. This is perverse. This, let's read that again. Whosoever walketh uprightly shall be saved, but he that is perverse in his ways shall fall at once. The perversions of the Word of God. See, this is, this is supposed to be the way of life. This book is supposed to teach us how to be, how to believe, what to believe, what to do, what not to do, how to conduct our lives so that we can continue to stand and be upright. Think about, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, but think about what God did to the serpent upon um, the serpent going to Eve and beguiling Eve. What did God do to him? Took his legs away. There is no way in the world now that the serpent can do this one thing, can he? He cannot walk uprightly. Never can. Never will. God took his legs away. He took, his, he took away his ability to stand. Think of what differentiates all, oh, listen now this is going to get good. Think about what differentiates us 
from the animal kingdom. The fact that God designed us in our normal state to walk uprightly on two legs. Bears can do it, doggies can do it, monkeys can do it, uh, deer can do it while they're charging. But how long does that, how they normally walk around? When you're, when you're in the woods, you're up in somewhere, I don't know whether there's black bear in Missouri now, when you're sitting out there in your deer stand and a bear comes walking up, he don't come walking up like this, his hands in his pockets like this going, boy, I wish I had me some rub. He's four-footed. God does not give them the ability to walk uprightly. He does man. So here's what I think is going to happen. I think man is going to fall under the dominion of the beast. And man, instead of walking uprightly, is going to fall and be his beast. Just think about it. You're saying we're going to walk around on all fours? Nebuchadnezzar did. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, just, just a thought, because what are they doing? They're trying to mix animal DNA inside human DNA. Animals don't walk on two legs. Think about it, people. But that verse, whoso walketh uprightly shall be saved, but he that is perverse in his ways shall fall at once. And I think this falling, boom, happens like that. I think it's what it does. Isaiah 28, 13. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward, or as they say from where I come from, fall backwards. They might fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. And isn't this, in, if you just if you study Isaiah 28, it's, a, it's loaded. He tells us to study the Bible exactly this way. Here a little, and there a little. This line, and then put this line upon it. Take this precept, and then put this precept upon it. That's how we're told to study the Bible, so that we can have understanding, so that our sword is two-edged. Here a little, there a little. Precept, precept, line, line. But here's the problem with Israel. Israel only has a single-edged sword. So they cannot study the Bible here a little and then there a little in the New Testament. They can't do it. They have no ability to do it. They refuse and reject that Goyim Bible, the New Testament, and that Goyim Messiah, Jesus. They hate it. They hate him. They hate us. They're enemies of the gospel. That's what Paul said. That's why you pray for your enemies, okay? Because God's going to save them. But God concluded them in unbelief. Why? Because they didn't want to believe. Blindness in part. They can't see the new covenant. They can't see it. It's not there to them. And they cannot read the Bible here a little and there a little. But that's how God tells you to do it. Here a little and there a little. And so you study this Bible. So do, do a little study here. Do a little study over here. Look at this word over here. Look at things that fall in the New Testament. Go back and look at things that fall in the Old Testament. And God said they're not segregated out. He said this precept is upon this precept. God's building wisdom and instruction for you by teaching you how to do that. But those who won't, they fall which way? They don't fall down on their face and worship God. They do what people do who are slain in the spirit and drunk. They fall backward. You ponder that for a while because we're going to talk about it. I'm not going to shy away from it. Jeremiah 25, 27. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink ye, and be drunken, and spew, and fall, and rise no more, because of the sword which I will send among you. Jeremiah 50, verse 32. And the most proud shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise him up. And I will kindle a fire in his cities, and it shall devour all round about him. So notice, and I just mentioned this. 
God said, in fact, Isaiah 28 is written to the drunkards of Ephraim. What do drunks do? Fall down. There's a clip, you'll be able to see it on YouTube. Type in Kenneth Hagin. This happened in St. Louis at uh, Life Christian Church. Rick Shelton was the pastor. Joyce Myers came out of this church. It's where she was part of. Okay? You're going to see Kenneth Hagin in there acting like a drunk. It's all big show. They act drunk. People are manifesting this drunk spirit. And Kenneth Hagin's going around tapping people. And he's saying, drunks, fall down. Drunks, reel around. Then he adds to the Word of God. He said, be not, um, be not drunk with wine where it is excess. Be filled, be drunk with the Spirit. He added to the Word of God to get his point across. He's telling everybody, be drunk in the Spirit. Mm -mm -mm -mm. That's what happens to drunkards. And let me tell you what God's going to do in these last days. God's going to take a big old cup of Babylon the Great. And He's going to fill it with His indignation. He's going to pour it out upon all the nations. That means all the races of men. And they're going to be mad in their drunkenness. Mad means crazy, out of their mind. And they're all going to fall. They're going to fall backward like drunkards do. People, if you're going to a church and they're talking about being drunk in the Spirit, get out of there. Get. Don't try to change. Don't try to save them. Now, I'm not saying that there might not be a few people that you, you know, could reach, but I'm saying that for the most part, that church has got Ichabod written all over it. And if you're yoked with them when they fall, you will go with them. Save yourself. If you can reach somebody in there, praise the Lord for it. But get out of these. God calls us out of these places and to unyoke ourselves with drunkards. Because when they fall, we're going to fall with them. So get away from them. Um, he mentions here again, Jeremiah 50, The most proud shall stumble and fall, none shall raise him up. So I think when this falling, when this final last day's falling takes place, that's it. God, there, nobody is going to raise them back up again. They will live in a perpetual fallen state. And as we go through this more, I'll show you what that looks like and I'll show you what it means. Daniel chapter 3, here is a, here is a picture of the falling away taking place. Daniel chapter 3, you remember Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 2, he, he revealed to Nebuchadnezzar what this image looked like. And so in Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar, it looks to me like he decides, you know what, I'm going to build that rascal because that was pretty cool looking. So he builds an image, 60 cubits tall, 6 cubits wide. Get it? Sixes all over him. So here, and think of Revelation 13, 603 score and 6, because in Revelation 13, the false prophet leads everybody to build an image of the beast and to do what? Fall down and worship it. He's going to cause everybody to worship it. So here we have Nebuchadnezzar telling everybody, let's read it, Daniel chapter 3, verse 7, Therefore at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages, what? Fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now, I want you to just think about this. I've used this in illustration before. It's one of my favorite illustrations. If you want to see what a falling away looks like, this is it. Think of, think of you on the, on the outskirts of this, and you're watching this, and you see all these, these sheriffs and these provincial leaders that Nebuchadnezzar gathered. He gathered together all, the, all of the politicians and governors of his kingdom. They came and they were going to worship this thing. Here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so you're watching this thing and all, you're standing over the plain of Dira and all of a sudden all the uh, praise and worship music starts. Okay? Singing, singing four lyrics... 800 times in a row, okay? And all of a sudden now, 
everybody falls except three guys. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's their Hebrew names. And do you think that it's easy now for Nebuchadnezzar and, of course, everybody watching to see who's on God's side and who's not? Who's on Nebuchadnezzar's side? Everybody that's fallen. Who's on God's side? The guys that are standing. They were upright. And did God save them? Absolutely. By the fourth in the furnace, the sun, don't get me started, the son of God. I learned that phrase in Swahili. Uh, Moana wa mungu. Moana, son, mungu, God. But their Swahili Bible said Moana wa miungu. Mi ungu, they add the I there. You know what that is? It's like adding an S at the end of one of our words. It's plural. Son of the gods. So there's the Son of God in with them, and they are saved. Okay? And they don't fall away. You know why? They believed. It was their belief. That caught, in fact, you, you know, I don't believe that. I think they did works, and God saved them by the works. Really? Let's just go read this, okay? Let's go read this. Daniel chapter 3. Oh, let's pick it up. Uh, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from, burnt, from the burning fiery furnace. They believed it before it ever happened. And he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, it be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. They believed what God said. They believed that God was going to save them. And, and so what did their belief cause them to do? It caused them to not be in fear and fall down and hope they got, they got away with it, with God. They believed what God said and what God promised them. That's why they stood. You, you, when, when you believe, God will help you stand. All right? But anyway, that's the picture of it. The, the man of sin is going to be revealed, and the world is going to fall as dead men before him. And you and I are going to see that. That's what it says. I can't, I can't believe. I don't have permission to believe anything else other than what exactly what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells me to believe, and that's exactly what I believe. Acts chapter 1, verse 24, And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. What happened to Judas? He, this, Satan entered into him. That's what it says. He was numbered among the twelve, wasn't he? That means he went to church with them. But was he of them? Couldn't be. He could not, Judas could not have had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in him. And then all of a sudden, he could not have been sealed by the Holy Ghost and then have Satan enter into him and unseal it. I don't believe that. Judas fell. How did he fall? He went and hung himself in the field of blood, Akildama, and he hung there so long that probably his body started ripping apart because that's what happens after about three or four days. You start coming apart. The Bible says that he fell from where he was hanging and his bowels gushed forth. Ugh, nasty stuff. Okay. But Judas, by transgression, fell. He was, you know who Jesus called Judas? Not the son of God. Son of perdition. Think about it. That's why he fell. 1 Corinthians 10, 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. I want you to look now to open your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. 
Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us, 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 these are our, our examples, they are examples for us. Go look at these stories, people. Go look at them. And what God did back then should be, it, it, it's, not, it's an example to us that we should not lust after the things that they lusted after. Remember what the thorns do and remember what they are. They are the lust of other things and they choke out the word. What happened to them in the wilderness? They lusted after other things. They, it choked out God's goodness to them. And what happened to them? Let's look at what it says. Neither be idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and what happened? Fell in one day three and 20,000. Think of what the Bible's telling you. The Bible's telling you, watch their example. Because here's what you have. You have people coming out of Egypt, but they never make it to the promised land. Why? Either stones or thorns, one way or the other. But the Word of God bore no fruit in them and they fell in the wilderness. One group of them, remember what happened to them? The earth opened her mouth and sucked them all down instantly. Okay? And Paul, our, our apostle, told us to look at those stories as an example. See, this is as an example to us who are living in this time. This is what it means, here a little, there a little. Line upon line, precept upon precept. That's what it's telling us. He's telling us how to avoid the falling. So let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Galatians 5, 3, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. The grace of God was there for you. You chose not to take it. You chose to follow and believe what Jim Staley told you who teaches right out of the Kabbalah, teaches the Sephiroth, the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil. He teaches it. I've, I've got the proof on it. By the time you watch this video, I will have dealt with that on a Pastor Mike online. You fell for that. You, you decided that God was telling you that you had to go back and keep Torah, that you had to go keep the law, but Staley made it easy for you because he said, now, we know that you can't keep all of it, so, but you keep as much as you possibly can because that honors and pleases God. And Paul just said here, if you want to do that, now you're in debt. You're in debt to do the whole law. And when you are, you're fallen from grace. And I submit to you, we can see it clearly, can we not? movements coming into Christian churches, movements that are based upon what Christians should be doing rather than what Christians should be believing. Oh, we believe in a church that does. We do and we do these things and we believe that you're not really a Christian if you don't do these things. It's all about taking people back under the curse of the law. The Hebrew Roots people do it. Seventh-day Adventist people do it. Liberal emergent Christianity is loaded with a works type salvation or a works based salvation. And it's basically making people become debtors unto the law and that causes them to be fallen from grace. That's what the Bible says. Now, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. 
Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. What was he talking about here in Hebrews chapter 4? What was he talking about? Paul was talking, I think that was Paul. Paul was talking about those who were wandering in the wilderness. And they got to the edge of the promised land, you remember that? And when they got ready to go in, they sent 12 people in to, for 40 days to look at the land. 12 guys come back. The law, 10 of them, said we can't go in there. It's too dangerous. We'll never make it. We can't go. The, the walls are too high. The people are giants. They're the sons of the Anakims. Um, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. That could very well be a, an exact ratio. We were, that's, that's how we were in their sight. And we're telling you the 10. Law. The 10 will tell you you can't go. And stop and think about this. Okay, The 10 commandments tells you you cannot go to heaven because you broke the 10 commandments. I have. So the Ten Commandments were never designed to get people to go to heaven. They are condemnation to us. And so the Ten Spies come back and they say, you can't go. And two of them, because in the New Covenant we're under how many laws? Two. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't that neat? In the New Covenant, the two witnesses tell us, absolutely, you can believe God. Believe what God said. God said it's our land. They're on our land. You know what God's going to do? God's going to kill them all for us. We don't have to do anything. We just go in there and say, Hi, it's our land, and God's going to take care of it. Don't be afraid. You know what the Bible says about Caleb? He had Go read this in Numbers. He had a different spirit in him than the rest of them did. His spirit was causing him to stand. The spirit that was on the rest of the Israelites caused them to fall. You see the difference? You see, you see that those, even though they're in church, even though they're board members and preachers and, and Bible college professors, if they have a different spirit in them, they're going to fall. No doubt about it. They're going to fall. So that's what he's teaching us. He said, uh, back in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And I'm just, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Those who believe, God gives them the grace to stand. Those who call God a liar, they've got a different spirit in them. They fall. Hebrews chapter 6. Let's just read the Bible. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified of themselves the Son of God afresh, put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessings from God, or blessing from God. But that which, look at here, there it is, that which beareth thorns, remember the seed sown among thorns? That which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. What do we do with these verses? Some people say, well, let's just take them out because, you know, that doesn't apply. Some people say, well, it's not really saying this. Let's just, let's just believe what it says, shall we? Now, something that I was looking at this one day, and I just decided when I was going to believe it, but it never actually said in Hebrews 6, verses 4, 5, 4 and 5, when it's describing these people, never actually said that they were saved. Never said it. These people, and notice that he talks about 
the rain coming down. You notice he talks about herbs growing up and bringing forth fruit, and then he brings in the thorns idea. That goes right back to the parable of the seed and the sower. That's the connection. These people who have once enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, um, are the same people in Mark 4 and Luke, uh, wherever it was we read that, in the book of Matthew, where the seed went in and they received it with joy. They received it. And for a while, they believed. But temptation came, or thorns grew up, and it choked out the word that was in them. They are the ones who fall away. I am persuaded, according to the scriptures, that true Bible Christianity and truly being born again, that belongs to people who never call God a liar after they've come to the truth and the knowledge of the Word of God for salvation. They keep believing. They stand in that faith and stand in that belief. That's what they do. These are the ones, the ones who are still standing, those are the ones who are sealed. Those are the ones who have the earnest. Those are the ones who have this Son of God, the inward man. These are the ones who have that which is born of God sinneth not, living on the inside of them. Those are the ones who bring forth the good fruit of God, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. But those who have been planted on stony ground, the hardness of their heart, or the wickedness of their sins that they will, they refuse to let God have, those people, they're the ones that are going to fall. And I believe that this is what it's talking about. So look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that what? Believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of what? unbelief. And I'm, I'm trying to make it, ex it's exactly that simple. Those who are truly born again, those who have the seal of the Holy Ghost in them, those who bring forth the fruits of righteousness, these are the ones who continued in belief. They didn't call God a liar. But those who fall away, it's just like here. Whom was he grieved with 40 years? Them that turned their backs on God and they stopped believing what God said. They fell because even though they endured for a while, they had an evil heart of unbelief. When the, when the 12 spies came back, and they said, we're going to make us a captain. We're going to go back to Egypt. And God said, oh, no, you're not. But you're not going into the land of rest either. I'm going to march you around in a circle until your carcasses fall in the wilderness. That's what God said. Now, I know that not everybody is going to believe this. I know that there's going to be some people that's going to try to cry against this, that's going to try to ridicule me, it's going to call me names, they're going to try to make videos or whatever. But I stand with the Word of God. These are the things in the Bible that fall. 
I don't want to be one of them. So I've decided, by God's grace, that I'm going to stand as with this being my help and my testimony that every word of God is pure. And I believe every word of God and I study to show myself approved unto that same God. And that's all I'm asking you to do as well, is to stand firm, not in man's doctrines, but in the doctrines of the Word of God. That's what I'm asking you to do. Will you do it? Will you stand with me? We're going to continue studying more of this. We're going to look at other things in the we're going to look at fallen angels, fallen cities, falling figs. We're going to look at a lot of things that are falling. But you take this back and examine it against the Word of God. All right, God bless you. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.